Hey, everybody. Welcome to uh, Data Engineers Lunch. Um, it's been a while since I've uh, done the introduction, um, so bear with me. I'm getting back, getting my um, link we're back on this. Um, I wanted to give a shout out to uh, Akwi, who uh, has been doing this, uh, and also Arpin. But uh, thank you, Akwi, for, for uh, managing this meetup. I really appreciate it. Um, my deck that I have for the data engineers lunch is taking a little longer. Give me one second. Here we go. You all should be able to see my screen. Mm -hmm. No, nope. looks like this is the wrong date. Oh, no, this is right. Um, yeah, welcome. This is uh, Data Engineers Lunch number 81. Um, and, you know, it's it's huge. I think the when we started it, uh, you know, right after the pandemic shut down, we did not know we were going to continue doing it, um, you know, well into the, what, 19, uh, sorry, 20, 21, 22, uh, third year. So uh, this is great. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about Actually, more than reverse ETL tools, I'm going to be talking about modern data platforms in general, because I feel like to dive straight into reverse ETL tools without talking about the whole modern data platform um, ecosystem would be short selling you all um, and leaving you with a lot of questions. And, and I think this is something that I'm going to keep expanding on, and maybe I'll do a talk in a few weeks. Uh, we're both co-organizers. We'd love to get folks to, to volunteer. Uh, or speakers, if you are working in data, data engineering, data science, data analytics, and uh, want to talk about how to get data in and out of systems, um, or you're a product vendor or an open source product vendor, we'd love to have you. Uh, and if you'd like to sponsor us, please feel free to reach out. We are made up of a diverse community of um, people in the DC community area, but there's a lot more people around the world that also tune in, so welcome. We're made up of several different meetup groups, um, and uh, there are ones specifically for data science or data visualization, or um, there's one called uh, Statistical Seminars. You want to learn more about R. What do we cover here? We cover here the get your shit together problem, which is how to get data into a database and do stuff with it and get it ready for people to use. Um, if you are new uh, in the chat, you can go ahead and drop, um, you know, just say hi, where you're from. Um, happy to have you here. Uh, you can also just, you know, ask questions or share something on the chat. Um, I will not be monitoring the YouTube chat. Akwi will be doing that uh, when I'm speaking. And so Akwi will alert me and then I'll try to get to it as soon as I can. We're one of the sponsors, our company, uh, we help people you know, build global data platforms with real-time technologies. Um, GW is another sponsor local to DC. Uh, we have some other local sponsors around here. And then we have some institutional sponsors that sponsor all of data communities. So thanks to all of you, we are able to make this happen. Um, we're always hiring at Anant. Go to our website. Um, if anybody has jobs or are looking for a job, just drop it in the chat. Um, I think you can put URLs in YouTube and not get in trouble. So if you have a resume, just drop a link. Um, we have a weekly meetup with Data Engineers Lunch. That's what you're seeing right now. Uh, it's recorded every week, so you can see all the previous ones. And uh, there's a weekly Cassandra lunch that happens also on Wednesdays, same time, uh, which you can check out as well. Um, as I mentioned, we're always hiring. There you go, careers.anot.us. Take a look. More events on Data Community DC from the larger, broader community. And our events are at anot.us slash events. We have a playbook that is available, uh, sorry, a runbook that's available on our website. Um, I think, Akwi, if you could drop the link in the chat, we can get to it. And uh, that's it. Let me go ahead and get started with, with my talk. Um, I gave a variation of this talk uh, last month, 
um, for a uh, product partner vendor um, with us. And um, they uh, are, you know, in the database space. And what we were talking about was how do you build um, modern data platforms today? And we have a playbook on how to do that. The playbook that we have involves how to design a platform, a data platform, although you can expand that into uh, you know, whole business platforms if you want, but we focus on data platforms these days. Uh, a framework for how to choose the components once you've designed or you've determined what you're trying to do, and then an approach to manage that. And so, again, I'm going to be talking a little, a little bit about the playbook, but the reason I have to tell you what the playbook is, and as you'll see, is that you know I can give you all the tools in the world, but if you don't know how to put it together, then you basically end up with um, the same pile of crap that you had 10 years ago and the 10 years before that which is nothing that ever works or is integrated well together. And, um, and that's the challenge I think I've seen in, in my career is that the technology does what it's supposed to do. It's just that the processes and the people around it don't know how to use it. And so the playbook is basically how to solve that problem. Um, and we'll take a look at some components which are cool in the open data uh, you know, toolkit, um, ETL and reverse ETL, specifically low code, no code, uh, ETL and reverse ETL that are open source. Some customer data platforms that are, you know, as good, if not better than some of the commercial SaaS software that's out there. And then some data ops tools for you have some time. And, and if we don't get to all of these categories, maybe I'll do a follow-up talk and we'll go dig deep into those. What do we do? We help platform owners reach beyond their potential to serve a global customer base. And that, that customer base wants everything right now. And you, you're probably one of those customers. So if you're using a global uh, or national brand, um, you know, you're using the toolkit that we work with. And so you may be even using their uh, software or interfaces that, that we have worked on. Um, how do we do that? We design with our playbook, we build our framework, and we manage our platforms. Uh, with our approach, and that's so that the clients can think and grow big, and that's what we're sharing today is the, the playbook on how to do that and um, and how to use the right tools, right? Regardless of what tools come around, how to keep making a system uh, grow and, and have it maintainable for the future. We work with a lot of companies. Um, you know, whatever the challenges we work on, so we we know the customer has a business problem. What are they stop trying to solve for the industry? What we do is we map that challenge to what kind of platform they need. And then that platform can be built with certain technologies. Uh, and then that technology has to be managed. So the way we solve those specific, how to take the business challenge and, and make a platform, how to take a platform and build it with the right technology, how to take the right technology and manage it with the right, right people and processes. Uh, we have solutions specifically knowledge on how to do that. And what it ends up being is once we've solved the problem, we can help people on an ongoing basis with a service catalog of, of you know, bespoke uh, specific items just for the client on how to manage their platform. Modern technology is super disconnected. Um, and by the way, my, my pitch is done now. I'm talking about what I came to talk about. <laughs> uh, modern technology is disconnected. Most companies want to create value, get the customer, um, deliver the value to the customer and get paid. Uh, if you take a look at this diagram, it's called MarTech 5000, but it's got more than 5000 logos on it. At this point, that's a two-year-old diagram um, that has 8,000 icons on it. And what are these? These are technologies that are just in marketing technology. Or let's say if you wanted to look into infrastructure automation, right? Um, there's a lot of different tools and technologies out there. And holistically, each business has a business platform, whether or not they know it. And in the deep and uh, kind of the core of the business platform is the data and analytics platform. And, and what do people need from data? They generally need to find information. They want to analyze it and they want to act on it. And you can say the finding is a matter of discovering it by browsing through something. It could be searching for it, filtering for it. Um, and you do that through various technologies and tools that you use when you're working for a company or if you're a customer of a company. 
then when you find some what you need to do, you know, uh, what you're looking for, sometimes you're looking at that either data or knowledge or or some sort of page, and you're like, okay, I'm gonna think about this, I'm gonna compare and contrast this, and then I'm gonna act on it. I'm gonna either use it, I'm gonna share it. Um, or let's say if you're on, on a website, you're gonna buy something, you're gonna act on that information. And so in an organization that has lots of different things going on, information is generally disconnected. Um, how do we bring that together so that the business is smarter? And that's what a data and analytics platform does. Um, it connects all the different parts of a business platform together. And as this platform serves for categories of people and, and things also. So customers, partners, and employees, and things as in devices or, or physical things, right? And the way it all is tied together is that there's five areas of business platforms, partner ecosystems, customer experience, info systems for employees, IoT systems for things. And in the middle is data and analytics. And you can't see it, it's kind of like right behind here, right? Um, so at our company, we talk about something called enterprise consciousness, where like if we could connect and unify and synchronize everything together, people, process, information, and systems, what would it look like? Uh, and in order to get there, we're constantly striving to build better data platforms for our clients, build better ways to build data platforms so that it becomes easier and easier for us as well as for our customers. And you know, going beyond just, just you know, having data available to, to, to people and synchronize, well, we're at, we're going uh, to try to help customers eventually is giving them a unified user, you know, user experience for their employees or their end users uh, backed by various different systems um, that works like an app. And that's what Silicon Valley growth, high growth, high tech companies have is they have a good user experience and legacy companies are constantly striving to do that for their users. They're trying to give them a user interface that feels like an app. The challenge is um, you can't get there unless you go through certain steps. Uh, you know, most companies they start off with silos. They they then adopt a standard enterprise wide. Then they they standardize their processes uh, and their data systems. And then finally, after that, they can standardize the interfaces and componentize systems in their company, and eventually even collaborate with other companies better. So in in our work. We tend to help customers figure out how to get here and then here so that they're able to do this, right? Most companies that we try to help, they're, they're stuck right here. They're trying to get to an integrated system, an optimized core uh, so that they can go forward. Here's an example, right? So small company has the same challenge. They use a bunch of SaaS applications, Google Drive, QuickBooks, WordPress, and there's these custom apps that have been you know, hosted on various systems. So somebody comes along and says, we're going to use Docker to run all the apps on Amazon. Or we're going to use Kubernetes. That's a new thing, right? And no matter what the language is, we'll support it as long as it has an API. Well, that's a standardization. And then eventually, to connect all those apps together, there's a uh, process of standardizing the processes, but also the data, so that all of these systems, all the SaaS systems, all the custom apps, can basically work together and that allows for business modularity. And at some point, the company has a data platform. They have a way to get data in, process it, store it, analyze it, and then send it through, whether it's in batch or in stream, um, it's all available to them. Uh, depending on when you built your data platform, it was either running on Oracle or, or MySQL or Postgres or you know, Google Bigtable uh, and, and BigQuery, uh, or it could be, uh, you know, using open tools like, um, well, Postgres is also open, but, you know, uh, open uh, data platform components like Cassandra or Spark or Kafka. It just depends on what you need. But most companies have some system that is a collection of data data tools and data processes, and that that is the data platform, right? Get, a, get data in, do something with it, and send it through. The modern open data platform allows us to build mature platforms, mature data platforms, without actually rebuilding and reinventing the wheel. And although there have been open source databases and open source tools like Spark and Kafka, the tools that were only available through commercial licensing or SaaS 
you know, monthly fees that were very expensive for smaller customers and smaller businesses, those tools are now becoming available to everybody uh, and they're much better. Um, and I'm a big proponent to pay for software and pay for services. Because if you're not paying for software, you're not paying for services, the people that make that software are not gonna work on it. And then you won't have those free tools in the first place. So what's the big deal about modern open data platforms? It's not the fact that it's free, it's the fact that it's open. And open means that you have the ability to run it anywhere you want, on your own hardware, in one cloud or the other, or, or, or many clouds, plus your on-premise, right? That's the value of having an open data platform. It's not the fact that it's free. You still may want to pay for these vendors to support you if you're a big enough company. So to do this, you know, uh, we have a three sections of our playbook, which is how to design a platform, how to build it, and then how to manage it. So in the design section of our playbook, we look at five things, the context, responsibilities, um, and uh, we say that uh, we look at these things. Every company has different contexts and different responsibilities, but we have a way of looking at it. We also recommend thinking about the approach, even if you don't use our approach, but having an approach to uh, managing the system, um, looking at which framework to use. So for example, a, uh, a company may say, well, we're just going to use AWS for everything. Well, then their framework now consists of components that just run on AWS. Or a company may say, we're going to be just Google. So it's going to limit their, their framework to things that are on Google, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, but it's good to be in the design mode, thinking about what your constraints are, right? If if you go into design, not thinking about, well, do I have to run on multiple clouds, then you're going to come into a challenge if you use AWS components and, and you're stuck using it, right? Um, and then tools, uh, you know, what are the tools that we're going to have at our disposal? You know, are we going to be able to use Terraform? Are we going to be able to use Azure DevOps? Uh, again, not going too deep into the into the weeds of what these are, but rather knowing what is available. I think the worst thing somebody can do is have a really great design that isn't executable, right? You got to have if you're if you're a skyscraper engine, you know, a skyscraper architect, uh, you kind of have to know what tools are available to build a skyscraper today, right? Uh, unless you're just making it for the future for somebody else to figure out how to do. How do you choose your, your stack, right? Your, your framework of tools to use. It's, there's so many, you Google op, you know, open data platform stack, you're gonna find a bunch of different pretty looking diagrams out there. I love collecting these diagrams. Um, and they are generally good. And most of these, by the way, are, are really just focused on batch processes. They're not really worried about real time um, as much as they're analyzing data that's been collected already, right? Um, and so we, we think that our approach to doing real-time data connected with these modern open data platforms allows you to, best, uh, to have the best of both worlds. Having that big, fast data technology set that is available to everybody as well as, uh, sorry, it's, it's, it has only been available to the biggest companies, uh, as, as well as these open tools that's available to everybody that become easier and easier to manage data, bringing them together brings you into the, into the next level of, of data processing. Uh, and how do you choose from this landscape? You know, let's say you you just say, I want to use open tools. Well, if you go to uh, the cloud foundations, you know, um, they have, there's a site called the Data and AI Landscape, right? These All these tools are open source. How do you choose from them? Uh, here's one that's a larger uh, categorization, Data and AI Landscape from, you know, from 2020 um, that has open and, uh, you know, um, commercial tools. In their case, they have a whole layer of just open tools, uh, and there's a lot of them in there as well. So using open tools and just saying we're going to use open source, um, it, it's, it's not, it doesn't, your job doesn't get easier, even though you have less to choose with, uh, choose from. So how do we take that enormity of, of logos and systems and, and uh, try to solve this problem of making, a, you know, a, a data platform that's open and scalable. Uh, well, we have to take an inventory. We go through an evaluation process for different components. There's a specific taxonomy, if you will, of what to choose, right? A checklist. And then finally, we go through the architecture engineering process, I, ideally so that we end up with systems that are just scriptable or configured, 
meaning low code, no code, clicks, not code, as Salesforce says, and, and less as less programming as possible. Because uh, the more programming you have to do, the more maintenance you have to do after that. And if we can automate it, we want to automate it. In the design phase, uh, we look at, as I was mentioning, the context and responsibility. So in this case, you have a business, people process information and systems across different departments or responsibilities of a company. And what you can see is as you compare these different processes with what type of data that needs to be managed with what systems they're on, you get a big picture of what, where the redundancies are. So in this case, customer information needs to be in three different uh, departments, but it also is managed in three different systems, which is one of the reasons why we have customer data platforms. Uh, it used to be that synchronizing this information was very, very difficult. So um, now with open tools that we're going to talk about, it's easier to do customer information synchronizing across the board. Here's a, a, a slightly more nuanced uh, canvas for uh, you know, a, a data platform for customers, uh, business product owners, the engineering team, and the operations team. And you know, how do they go through all of these um, you know, adding data, getting reports, integrating that data? Uh, where is the information that is basically uh, you know, used by everybody? Where does that data sit? Um, so whether you're looking at a whole business or just an application in the business, the canvas allows us to find patterns and then allows us to make better decisions with our tools. We have a rubric for why we consider uh, a component to put into our framework. Uh, and and uh, what I mean by our framework, it's, it's a opinionated, curated list of tools organized by the type of tool it is um, that we know that, that they work well together. But why would we choose those tools uh, to keep it in our framework? Well, it's distributed. It allows uh, for execution across the world or across regions. If it's a software that cannot run on multiple um, regions of a cloud uh, and be redundant, then we're, we're not looking at it as hard because that could mean a failure for a company that we're working with. Is it real time? Uh, real time meaning uh, can many, many, many users interact with the system and get what they need? And I'm not talking about uh, just a website. We're talking about being able to pull reports or being able to glean information from some machine learning process. Can they get that information as fast as possible? Is it extendable? Is it open? Right? Why do we want an open toolkit? Well, because let's say we, we want to do something and the tool doesn't do it, then we should be able to do it, either because it has an API or it's open source or it's open core and we can do something different with it. We have to be able to automate it. That's the future. If we can't automate it, then that means that there's something uh, that's gonna hold us back from continued scale. Uh, and can we monitor and manage it? Uh, you know, it, it, Back in the day when people were building their own data centers, they would look for a physical device like a switch and say, "What is the? does it support SNMP? Which was the simple network monitoring protocol. Right. Um, well, now it's not that important because, you know, the clouds do all that for you. So the software itself, is there a way we can get metrics about how it's executing? Right. Can we manage it properly without having to go into the interface? Does it have APIs for that? So so that is important for us to be able to reduce the number of systems needed to manage the whole thing. And yes, if you look at the clouds. Uh, that are available, um, and you decide, hey, we're going to do everything Amazon. Amazon's components meet most of these, except it's not open. You can't move it. It is extendable, but you can't move it from one system to the other. You can't move DynamoDB from Amazon to Google or uh, or Azure. Uh, actually, you can. There are different ways to do it. Like ScyllaDB has a DynamoDB wrapper. Um, Datastax is coming up with a Stargate plug in to do DynamoDB on top of um, uh, Stargate. So maybe, yeah, maybe DynamoDB is not a good good uh, uh, you know, one to talk about. But essentially, if there's something that only like uh, only um, Amazon has, like Amazon Lambda, you have to find some equivalent for it. So most of the time, clouds are, you know, they're compliant. Like you have S3, you have ADLS, blob storage on, on Azure, you have Google file system on Google. Right. So even if it's cloud native to one particular vendor, 
you tend to uh, you know, find uh, components that are similar. And so it is possible to use our framework purely on a cloud native solution. Um, here's one for Microsoft. You know, they have parallels. Uh, you know, they don't have uh, Amazon uh, RDS, AWS RDS. They have managed databases by Azure, right? Similar. Uh, same thing with Google. You know, they don't have uh, managed databases by Azure. They have a cloud database for Postgres, right? We have nothing against the clouds. I would say it's good to use cloud technology because it's going to be cheaper. But there's times when if it's commoditized, the cloud is going to be better. But then there's other times where the cloud may seem cheaper. But if you want to have uh, some flexibility, then you have to look to open core uh, as, a, as a different option. And open source offers that. Uh, here's, you know, uh, just in the distributed data platform space, a uh, number of tools that are open core that have parallels. So, for example, uh, Cassandra is open source. Uh, Yugabyte is now open source as well. Uh, Azure Cosmos D source, but it supports CQL. It supports SQL. Uh, Spanner is not open source, but it, per, but it uh, supports the Postgres compliant version of SQL. Same thing with CockroachDB, Postgres compliant version of SQL. Uh, TIDB, the MySQL compliant version of SQL at a distributed uh, scale. Keep that in mind, because when we start to talk about these other tools for ETL and reverse ETL, they may only be compliant with SQL um, and not necessarily Bigtable's query language or Dynamo's query language, right? Uh, not going to get too much into this, but there's tons and tons of tools out there that do something for companies when it comes to distributed data. Uh, today, we're just going to talk about how to use, you know, these cool ETL, reverse ETL tools with distributed databases, because quite frankly, you don't need Spark if you can just point and click to say, get data in here, right? You don't need Confluent uh, Kafka streams to do stream processing if you can use a low code tool to say, move my data from here to here to here and do this thing on it, right? So the larger, uh, more accessible uh, open core, open data platform tools that are out there are in um, automation world, uh, in the integration world, and, and just general modernization, uh, which would include things like data catalogs and, and data uh, schedulers. Um, so you know, just a quick, uh, these are kind of organized by lanes. This lane here, you know, there's, there's data catalog here, Daxter and Apache Airflow are great for uh, scheduling complex processes of data data ops. Uh, NIFI allows some streaming of information. It's not the same as Airflow. People think, think it's very similar. It's not. It's completely different. Um, on this side are amazing tools for visualizing and reporting on information, some that are very niche. So Jupyter being more for data science stuff uh, and PostHog being for customer information. And in the middle, you have things like Airbyte, Rudder, Stack, Grouperoo, for getting data in and getting data out without programming, without too much programming. Um, and you have other tools out there that kind of mimic, uh, like Google Analytics, so plausible mimics uh, Google, Google Analytics. Uh, Jitsu makes it easy to move data between customer data platforms. And, and uh, many of these are, in fact, I would say every single icon in this list is open source. You can find it. So we're going to take a look at a few of them. Um, and I'm not going to do a hands-on, and that would be a 30-minute uh, talk by itself. Um, but that's why I think this is great to talk about the larger ecosystem of what is out there, and maybe we'll do more deep dives later on. So the approach of, like, how do we take this glut? How do we come up with this list? Well, we have an idea of a data platform uh, that we look at a data platform like a computer, like a physical box. Right before people had laptops and iPads and iPhones, you used to go and buy a computer and you used to build it. You would get a case, you would get a motherboard, you would get CPU, you'd get memory, hard drive, you connect it all together, and then you would have a computer uh, and you'd hook up a monitor, keyboard, and mouse, and then you have to open, you have to load an operating system. So we look at the data platform as a computer, and then that computer has a RAM, RAM being memory, right? RAM access memory or a bus. 
And so when we think about queues, we look at them as sometimes as a bus to move information, but also as a way to quickly uh, get information. Uh, we can also think about the queue processing technologies that are out there and distributed compute technologies that are out there. And we look at that as like a CPU. Uh, persistent storage, disk uh, or RAM. So persistent storage could be like a database or it could be like Google S3, uh, sorry, Google File System or Amazon S3, right? Just a place to dump data and get it back. Um, and then you have a reporting engine and you have an orchestration framework and then you have a scheduler. Well, these kind of uh, you know, correlate to a display or a motherboard or an operating system. And each of these components can be implemented in different ways. Google Native, everything on Google. You can do self-managed open source. Um, but there is a, a category of software that I'm, I'm showing that doesn't fit into what, let's say, all the clouds provide. I mean, they're starting to. Um, AWS and, and, and Microsoft, I know, are coming up with tools that are similar to Airbyte. So like on, on, and even I think AWS has it, but they're not as good. Like Azure Data Factory is good until you start to look at some of these tools. They're like, wait, these are way better than Azure Data Factory. Or, um, you know, AWS Data Management uh, Studio, at Data Migration Studio or something like that. It looks cool until you look at these tools. And these tools always innovate faster than the big companies. And that's why, I mean, that's another reason why I like open source is that they're not waiting for anybody, right? They're just going to continue to innovate. And when you put it all together, um, you eventually get a open data platform that can run on any cloud. That's the ideal goal for us. Can you take the same exact platform and run it somewhere else completely without compromising on what you're getting? Once you have a data platform, well, how do you keep it? We build it. How do you keep it? How do you keep it going? How do you keep it? from falling apart. And uh, the basic approach for, for us is, from a management perspective, is people need to manage a knowledge base so that the next person who comes and works on that team can quickly know how to set up. Uh, they can not only onboard themselves and train themselves, but they can also train somebody else. Uh, they can administer, they can configure, and they know how to manage the knowledge going forward. Um, this approach is, just tried and true, like, it, you know, uh, McKinsey has a thing, like, uh, as a statement, it's like, organizations that have knowledge management in place are 75% more efficient than others. And so you apply that to the microcosm of data platforms, you're going to be 75% more, uh, percent more efficient than you were before. And you can start with just having one page per component or, and I'll, I'll share another diagram, but like per component or for the whole platform, and then and, and it kind of goes deeper. So for example, you have a framework, you can have, how is the whole framework, how does the whole platform set up? And for all the components that make up that particular uh, platform, having a page that has the same exact things, how do you set up that particular component? How do you train on that particular component? And then if you have any third party or internal resources, like, you know, the repositories or the books uh, or, or websites, you can have that here. Um, mind you that we're not saying you have to use MacDocs or Confluence or Google Docs. You can use anything you want. The point is that it's a predictable schema for how you organize your knowledge. This is very important because if, let's say, you do decide to use one of the cool tools and a little bit of time passes and somebody else comes along, they can say, I want to replace this tool with something else. Well, they can at least understand where is that tool going to fit? Is it going to sit under the data or the compute or the infrastructure? Um, does it 100% replace it or does it just augment it? When you have uh, all the tools at your disposal, um, you can come up with a data fabric. And a data fabric is where data comes in and is available to everybody. It is not a data lake where data comes in and it has to, it's not available to everybody. It's only available to analysis um, uh, or, you know, data scientists. Um, and it's usually dirty, right? Like the data lake itself doesn't offer an insight. Uh, data fabric is different. A data fabric allows the data from across the enterprise to be synchronized um, all the time. And I'm going to show these diagrams and then I'm going to show you the tools that can make all this happen. So very quickly, uh, you know, a distributed database allows us to make a data fabric 
that is scalable regionally, globally. You can't do that with a relational database. It will fail. It cannot handle the number of reads and writes. Even if you have master slave replication, that means that all the writes have to go to the master and, and, the, and the, uh, the reads have to go to the replicas of the slaves. Um, Cassandra is one of those databases that makes that possible. Um, and you can build a modern uh, you know, open data platform around Cassandra and use tools like Airbyte uh, to get data in. And you can use tools like Group or Root to get data back out to those systems. Okay, that's the reverse ETL aspect of it. Um, it's different from a data warehouse also. A data warehouse has generally data coming in streaming or um, via batch, but the people that access the data warehouse, they're not everybody. It's not a million people, right? It's not a billion people. A data warehouse is for a small number of people to do queries on top of it. So when we talk about data fabric, it's having that data available to everybody at all times in real time. Yugabyte is another database that allows you to do this. Um, I'll also do another slide on SillaDB at some point, but the, the unique thing about Yugabyte is that it allows you to do not only CQL, which is like Cassandra, uh, and it also allows you to do actual SQL, like Postgres. So uh, a lot of these systems that I have here, they do support Cassandra through this CQL because CQL is similar to SQL, um, but other systems that only can work with Postgres uh, they would need something like Yugabyte. Uh, you get data in. There's tools, uh, and we'll, we'll pull up a writer stack and Airbyte. They're open source, right? You can find uh, commercial versions of Airbyte and writer stack that are supported. You can also pay for stuff like Stitch data or Hebo data that do similar things. Uh, specific to Yugabyte, um, there are ready to go APIs that you can just latch onto the top. And because it's um, based on, uh, it has a Postgres API. Hasura, for example, can expose GraphQL, or um, Postgres can expose REST API just out of the box. Once you have your data in your data fabric, uh, you can always send it back with reverse ETL tools. So Group Roo, uh, and Airbyte are now together as one company. Group Roo, uh, has the ability to get data to different systems, Rudderstack as well. Uh, Rudderstack focuses on customer data platforms. And so they already have connectors to a lot of systems out of customer data. Uh, you can also use Spark, Kafka Connect, Pulsar IO. Nobody stops you. It's just these low code tools allow you to do it without too much programming. And when you put it all together, right, um, you've got data coming in. You are able to process and analyze it and save it back to the fabric. And then you're able to serve it back to people either as APIs or through the systems that they're already using. So the key data, you know, the key takeaways for open data platforms is don't reinvent the wheel, okay? There are things out there. Uh, you have to have the right objectives. So you may only need to move information and have it available for commerce information, or you may only need to worry about customer information. Uh, don't start off with saying, we're going to synchronize all the data and get it here together on day one, right? Getting one flow in, of information in, in real time back and forth, it then provides you internal knowledge on how to do it for the next thing and the next thing and the next thing after that. Uh, I would say prioritize DevOps and data ops, because when you get to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing after that, you want it to be easier and easier and easier. If you do everything manually, even though you document it, yeah, and you should document it. It'll be harder and harder and harder as people come and go. So if you document it, good. Then you automate it and you, and you document the automation, then other people can help maintain the platform going forward, whether or not they stay with the company. Uh, and then finally, as I mentioned, um, you know, use open tools that are supported. So documenting is great, but if you use open tools that are well-supported already, they already have great documentation. They already have great support. So you're able to take their work and build on top of it. All your data um, does not need to be in a data fabric. Data Lake has a purpose. A data warehouse has its purpose. Uh, you should use them. You should have a data warehouse. You should have a data lake. They're great components to have. Uh, but when you have a data fabric, what you're able to do is take advantage of software that you were previously waiting on information 
to get there for you to be able to use it. You can now use that information in real time. Uh, I'm, uh, I, wanna, I don't want to say that's, a, that's the end of my talk because I want to show you a few things, but um, I'll come back to this. Um, Airbyte, I've mentioned a few times. Uh, Airbyte is a tool that uh, it, we have a few examples of it. I think we've done uh, uh, some uh, talks on it as well. Um, I don't want to buy Air, Airbyte today. Sorry. It's kind of aggressive. First time you go to the site, they're like, buy us. Um, so Airbyte allows you to basically make data pipelines, right? Through clicks, not code. Uh, it's open source. It's available. It has tons and tons of connectors um, for, for like getting data from a marketing system into your data warehouse or just even using it for data database replication, right? Uh, and, and it's open. Uh, you can build uh, connectors, and the connectors end up being a Docker container, and they just run in the system. So it's really sweet. Group Aru started off as a separate company, and uh, they are now a part of Airbyte. Uh, and their primary goal was to synchronize data back from your data warehouse uh, to send it back to different systems. Right. So uh, they started off as being primarily reverse ETL. So when you start to use Airbyte, you'll notice in their catalog, is there, they have a list of, there we go, connectors. Right, they have sources and destinations now, right? Sources being for ETL and destinations being for reverse ETL. So they're kind of supporting all this too. And, Basically, um, if it's not natively part of Airbyte, you can start to think about Group or, or, or something else like RudderStack. RudderStack uh, is also a reverse ETL tool, and it focuses on customer data. Right? It does CD, it does reverse ETL, but if you think about it, it's really focused on customer data, right? And if you look at the integrations, they've got similar to Airbyte sources and destinations. So they do ETL and they do reverse ETL. And then Jitsu is um, a software that is, a, is an open source version of Segment. Now Segment had its own, has its own data ingestion pipeline, right? So if Jitsu is gonna be the open source Segment alternative, uh, then they have to offer the same feature. So uh, Jitsu um, offers you the ability to, similar to these other ones, get data from a bunch of different places where you may have data about a customer and has destinations like databases um, for you to get this information. But the other thing that it has is it's not just an ETL tool. Uh, it allows you to connect um, like, for example, if you have a user interface and you want to collect information about a user, you can get that from JavaScript and you can send it right through, right? So it's more than just an ETL tool. It's a, it's a customer data platform. It allows you to collect data for your customers and your, and your users that allows you to provide them value later on. And then one last one that's, again, um, you know, related to uh, the whole, like, uh, uh, you know, customer data, um, uh, but as well as ETL, is there's a tool called PostHog. And PostHog offers you features that you wouldn't necessarily think about from an ETL or a uh, reverse ETL perspective or, or a customer data perspective. It's a type of stuff that you would pay for, you know, at Mixpanel or, uh, and, and, you know, some things of, of this is like, they're similar to Google Analytics, but like session recording, um, product analytics on how people are using your software, A and B testing. Okay, why is what what does this have to do with customer data, or what does it have to do with ETL? Well, quite frankly, if you're making a product and you are a product company, you're going to need to collect data for your product that goes into your data warehouse, and you want to churn that information, process that information back uh, into insights that you can then give back to your users, and this is just one of the ways for you to interact with that data set. Tons and tons of cool stuff out there. Um, I hope you find that, uh, you know, the approach that we talked about, the playbook was useful. Uh, the future talks that I'm gonna do will go deeper into each of the categories. So if you think about this, um, where is it? 
we go right here, right? We talked a little bit about ETL and reverse ETL. There's so many tools that are in this area. Um, we have in the past talked about uh, infrastructure as code. We've talked about uh, Airflow, uh, which is you know the the uh, the, uh, the data ops, for example, uh, orchestration of data processes. So we've done a talk pretty much on one of these areas already. Uh, but I think uh, as we as we grow and mature as a company, and we've grown and mature our playbook, we're recognizing that all this stuff fits together. It fits together in a bigger picture. Uh, and and once you organize everything into a picture, it becomes a lot easier to digest, right? Otherwise, you're thinking about hundreds, of, hundreds and hundreds of components. Now you can think about it as, well, I don't have to know every single component. I just need to know what type of component. And then I can do the research at any given time to find the best component to fit. So today, there are many apps out there for low-code, no-code app generation. Tomorrow, that may change. Uh, that whole category may change. But we know we're always going to have user experiences. Uh, DevOps has changed over the last 5, 10, 20 years. Um, we know DevOps is going to be around. Uh, it may be done by, by machines, but it'll be there. Um, in fact, DevOps and data ops are, are the first place where people are starting to use machine learning, but it doesn't mean that we don't have DevOps. DevOps is going to stick there for the long run. That's basically what I wanted to come across uh, uh, today was, you know, what are the different, uh, uh, you know, platforms and components that are out there that are part of the open data platform? Um, I, would, I would say it's a movement. There's a lot of different people talking about open data. Um, and the other is that there is a way to digest all of this. There's a way for you to Take all of this, um, and even you know, if you were to go broader, right? Even something like this, you can start to break it down. Um, that's all I have today. Um, you know, thank you for having me uh, talk for this long. Uh, are there any questions? Let's take a look. So, all right. So, could you display for GCP? Need to take a screenshot. Um, yeah, so uh, you know, um, this is if you just look for Google Google Cloud architecture on Google Images, you'll find these diagrams. It's not something that I made, right? So just go grab it from there. Um, uh, question: um, How do you get people to keep documentation updated? Um, gotcha. So how do you get people to keep documentation updated? Um, I learned on a government project. Ironically, uh, because if you're the government, you know you're going to be there forever. So you have to make sure that documentation is there for the next guy in line or the next girl in line. Um, in our delivery of projects, the acceptance criteria for every Agile story was if it's a problem that was solved, document what was the problem, how you solved it, and where's the proof that it was solved. Um, and anything a spike or a story or a task or a subtask or an issue, it didn't matter what it was, we would always have some document created. Um, so that's one way to do it. You make people do it. Um, you know, sorry guys, like, you know, it's it's work, okay? So if you're gonna do work right, you have to have standards, you have to have policies and you have to enforce those policies. The other is you make it easy. So I've documented, on Google Drive, on Confluent. Um, Confluence is a wikis tool by Atlassian. I hate it and I love it. Uh, <laughs> uh, you can use uh, Git Markdown, right? In your code, you can have these stack, uh, you know, schemas. Like every repository has a stack in it, right? How do you set it up, right? Um, or you can use a McDoc site. Uh, generator. That's a that's an open source one that's out there. Or DocuSource is another one, where documentation is code. So um, it is a product that is released just like anything in the whole organization. If a platform is going through iterations, the documentation also goes through iterations. And so you can borrow something from product companies, right? If you go to a product company like let's say DataStax, right? You go to their docs.datastax.com. Every version of their documentation is documented. Well, if they didn't have their documentation, they wouldn't be worth the money we're paying for it, quite honestly. Um, so it is not just, uh, you know, how do you get people to, uh, you know, to, to keep stuff document documented. 
it becomes part of the work. And it's not one of those things where, oh, I have to go document this. You train people from day one that this is the thing. The work involves documentation. End of story. Um, I'm, I'm being very practical here. I've learned the hard way that uh, when you don't document stuff, it becomes 10 times harder for people to grow, uh, for teams to grow, for teams to scale. Um, and I've seen it done well and I've seen it done badly. But um, some documentation is better than no documentation. Hopefully that answers your question. Any other, anything else? All right. Well, thank uh, no more questions. Excellent. So thank you so much for uh, everybody uh, joining us today. Uh, if you would like, uh, our company can help. We can do a design workshop. We can do an innovation sprint. Uh, or we can build a service catalog around what we need. Uh, we also have a lot of free stuff available. Uh, you can go to our website. Um, we have run books. We have a link to our playbook. Um, we have tons of videos on YouTube. Uh, we have tons of stuff on SlideShare. All of this stuff is linked. Um, so, and, and by the way, lots of code examples on GitHub as well. So check us out on not.us. And uh, we will see you next week, if not on Wednesday for Cassandra Lunch. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of the day, evening, morning. Peace.